gospel according to St. John chapter 15 verse 9. Hear ye the word of the Lord. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. God's word for God's people and God's people said amen. amen. You may be seated. Love, love love. There are a lot of songs out about love, and it seems like the songs that are made about love tend to last for a long time. If I were to start off and say love and happiness, love will make you do right. Love will make you do Y'all know that song because it's about love, and love is what lasts. And that is what Jesus is talking about after a last meal with his disciples. He's talking about love. He knows he's getting ready to go somewhere, and so he's trying to give them some instructions before he leaves. And he tells them about love. See, the text that I read is actually a second portion of the chapter. And in the first portion of the chapter, Jesus talks about being a vine and talking about fruit. And I like to watch vines grow because vines are, they're, they're plants that have what they call stems or runners. And they kind of go all over the place and everywhere they go, the fruit grows upon them. And the fruit of the vine, like if we got grapes on a vine, the grapes get their nourishment by being on the vine because they're connected. Everything is connected, and because it's connected, it works together. Uh, just like we get our help from being in a system. The fruit of the vine is connected to the vine, and the vine helps the fruit. And we are connected to one another, and that's how we help each other. Uh, I know we like to think that we got all where we got by ourselves, but I'm here to tell you we didn't. We are where we are today because somebody loved us. I don't know about any of y'all, but I didn't come out of the womb walking and talking and paying bills and taking care of business. Somebody had to take care of that for me until I was able to do it on my own. Somebody had to feed me until I was able to feed myself. And then when I got to school, I didn't learn everything on my own. Somebody had to teach me how to read and write and do arithmetic. And somebody had to teach me my right from my left. I didn't learn it on my own. And then as I grow older and go through college, somebody had to teach me these things. I didn't learn them by myself. We all are connected. I didn't get a job by myself. I did not qualify myself by myself. I did not interview myself for the job. I did not make the business that made the job available. I did not interview myself and say, okay, I'm going to pick myself for the job. I had help. We are all connected whether we want to admit it or not. But the funny thing about a vine is that vines grow in all kind of directions. And no one part of the vine is any more important than the other. 
No one part of the vine is more important because it grows higher than one and one grows straight out. No one part of the vine is better because it got on a better fence than the other part of the vine. And that's just like the church as well. Just because you have a position does not mean you are any better than anybody else. Just because you have a position, just because you have a title does not make you any better than anybody else. We are all connected. In life, just because you got some letters behind your name, just because you may have a little more money in your pocket than one or the other, it does not make you better than anybody else. We are all connected. And because we are all connected, we ought to be able to treat one another like we are all connected. We ought to be able to treat one another in love. The position does not make anyone more powerful than the other. For we are all just blades of grass in God's eyes. Amen? And so, we have to be connected. And in order to be connected, there needs to be communication. I have my day job where I work with technical equipment. And... Um, I work with this technical equipment, and there are projectors and calendars and processors and schedulers and touch panels and all this stuff and microphones and speakers, and I get them all working because they're all connected to one another over a computer system. And there is this one room, one room in the building on the second floor on the right-hand side when you come out of the elevator, one room. EC, which stands for Energy Center, 2S, which stands for Second Floor, South Side, Room 103. I know this room intimately because it always breaks down. The reason it always breaks down is because it's the furthest from the system. Uh, we have a home base or a server that connects everything in that building, and that room is the furthest away from the server, and so I always have problems with that room. It's named after elements on the periodic table, so there's a room called oxygen, and there's a room called neon, and there's a, a room called chlorine, and a room called fluorine. This room in particular is called lithium. Lithium always gives me problems. Power outage, I'm going to lithium. Computer system down for the whole company, I'm going to lithium. Thunderstorm, I'm going to lithium all the time because it is the furthest away from the base and it goes down all the time. And so what I do when I go into that room is I have to reprogram all the devices in that room and I have to tell it what its name is, what its address is, what is the device job to do. I have to remind it that. And once I get that going, it starts working again. The funny thing about this is it's connected to a system kind of like a grape is on a vine of grapes. It's connected to the system. Nothing ever comes unplugged. Nothing is ever unplugged when I go into that room. Nobody unplugged anything. Nobody turned anything off. It's still connected to the system. And so the problem is, it's not that it got disconnected, but it missed the communication from home base. And so it's my job to go into the room and tell this device who it is and whose it is. And once I tell it who it is and whose it is and what it's supposed to be doing, it starts acting right again. That's not too much different than this job. So let me remind everybody in the room, there is no disconnection. Sometimes there's just a lack of communication. And there may feel like some times where you've been disconnected from the Father, but you haven't been disconnected from the Father. A message, didn't just, a message just didn't get through. And that's okay. That happens sometimes. God still loves you. And God will continue to love you. And there will be some times in your life where you feel like God doesn't love you. That happens to everybody. I was just reading a story about Mother Teresa one of the most charitable persons on this earth, opened up all kind of orphanages and helped people all over the world. And she herself went years sometimes without hearing from God. Didn't know if God was still there. Didn't know if what she was doing was all right. And so if she, doing, dedicating her entire life to the work of the Lord, 
can sometimes not hear God, I think I will not hear God sometimes myself. But it's not that I'm disconnected. I just missed the message. I missed the communication. And so if you missed the communication, you may have cried all night long. But the Bible says weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. You might have thought there were some things you've done in your past that don't let you allow access to God. But the Bible says that there is no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. You might not be perfect. You might have made some mistakes. But the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You may have more month than money right now. But the Bible says my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You might have been told you aren't anything or you won't amount to nothing. But I stopped by to tell you you are a part of a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are the apple of God's eyes. You may be facing an an enemy you think you can't beat. But the Bible says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You might think you might not be able to beat the enemy, but you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you, Christ Jesus. And if you think you might lose that, but I, the Bible says that I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, or depth, or anything else in all creation, nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He loves you and there is nothing that you can do about it and there is nothing that will separate you from it. God loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. God loves you. It doesn't matter who you are. God loves you. It doesn't matter how much money you have in your pocket. God loves you. It doesn't matter what your rap sheet looks like. God loves you. It doesn't matter what kind of education you have or do not have. God loves you. God loves us and it doesn't matter if somebody else doesn't. You can't depend on the the acceptance of friends. Sometimes you can't even depend on the acceptance of family. But you can always depend on the the, the acceptance and the love of God. Because you don't have to do anything to deserve. Friends and family, when you do the wrong thing or don't do what they want you to do from time to time, you're going to fall out with them. But you won't fall out of love with God. One of, one of the things that is, has, has been determining for me when I get, quote unquote, new friends is how they act when I am not around. I've made some new friends just based on how they acted when I was not around. There were some friends that if I was not around and somebody else started talking about me, and they'll do that. They'll talk about all of us when we're not around because they think it's okay. But I don't worry about somebody coming back to me and telling me what it is so-and-so said. I want to know why they were comfortable enough to say it around you. And what exactly what it, what was it that you did in response to them? And so some of my newest friends have become some of my closest friends because they have defended me when I was not around and defended my character because they did it out of love. And so not only do we have to not necessarily depend on friends and family when they're not around, we ought to be able to tell ourselves we love ourselves. Uh, it doesn't matter what anybody calls you. It matters what you answer to. And it doesn't matter what somebody says about you. It matters what you say about yourself. So we ought to all get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I love you. You are awesome. You are going to make it today. If you don't start with what you tell yourself, how are you going to make it else through the day? If anybody else is able to tell you something bad about yourself and knock you off track, it's not love. So we ought to be able to love ourselves. We are our own worst enemies. What we tell ourselves, what we feed ourselves, what we allow to play over and over in our heads about ourselves. We're not good enough. We're not, kind, we're not good looking enough. We're not smart enough. No, we ought to be able to tell ourselves we are the righteousness of God. We are created in God's image and God doesn't make mistakes in his creations. God loves us and we ought to love ourselves. 
And so he talks about this love and, and everything being connected. And he tells us in the text that the father loves the son. Oh, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He sent his son to die for our sins. He loved us that much. And the son loves the believer. The Bible says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. And later on goes on to say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. Jesus loved us so much, he stepped out of eternity and became human and dwelt with us to save us. So the father loved the son, and the son loved the believers. And so what are we supposed to do as believers? We're supposed to love one another. Uh, in the gospel, according to Matthew, uh, around chapter 22, uh, Jesus is having a conversation with some Pharisees and some Sadducees. And it says that hearing that Jesus has silenced the Sadducees in Matthew 22, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in all the law? Jesus said, you should love the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And a second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws hang all the law and the prophets. Or on these two commandments, rather, hang all the law and the prophets. So if we were to, to just take the whole Bible and give you the Cliff Notes version. Love God, love people. It's a lot deeper than that, but if you love God and love people, you'll be on the right track. And how can you say you love God who you can't see and have not seen but don't love your neighbor who you see every day? Yes, I am a pastor. Yes, I preach sermons. But you all will preach more sermons than I ever will in my entire life. You all will be the only Bible that some people read. There will be a bunch of people who base their decision on whether or not to try this Jesus out, whether or not to come to this church, whether or not to, to, to worship this God that you worship based on how you act. Amen. Amen. And if you don't act in love, they're going to have nothing to do with the church. The, 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 the largest growing segment of the population of people who are considered nuns. None as in N-O-N-E, non-affiliated. Non they, they don't affiliate with any sort of official religion or anything. They're spiritual. They'd rather worship God and worship Jesus on their own. Why? Because the people in the church have acted like it's not a hospital for sick people. The people in the church have started taking this come up out from um, among them mentality and not operated in love. Or when they operated in love, they just used that as an excuse to tell somebody off. But I'm telling you off in love. I'm going to talk about you, but I'm telling you in love. It's not about that. So we ought to be able to love God and love people. And if we start with those two things, we'll be able to get on the right track. And so those are the priorities that the father loves the son and the son loves the believer. And it's the believer's job to love other believers. And then there's the proof uh, Jesus gives us the example of perfect love. No greater love than this one who lays down his life for a friend. We experience a little bit of sacrifice like that, and we have experienced giving that sort of sacrifice. Those of us who are children have, uh, may not know this, but our parents and our grandparents had to sacrifice for us. There were times where they had to go without so that you could have and then those of us who are on the other end, who are our parents, we've had to sacrifice for our children. But the ultimate sacrifice is to lay down your entire life for it. And that is what Jesus did. He did it for the sinners as well, not just for his disciples, not just for those who were already in the church. Because the church is not some exclusive club that is closed for membership. Uh, we're, we're, we're not taking new applications right now. Why don't you try back in six months? No, 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 no. Anybody... God's grace is available for all. God's love is available for all. We don't, as believers, we don't put a, a, a guest list on heaven. We don't have a heaven or hell to put anybody else in anyway. 
So he laid down his life for us. And now he does this for the disciples and he calls them friends, not servants. And the word that is used for friends is connected also to the same word that is used for brotherly love. And so when he calls them friends, he's calling the disciples those who are loved. Jesus is letting his disciples know that I've loved you. I love you. I've loved you. I, I, I have a love for you, and I want you to be able to take this love and spread it out amongst the nations and treat other people in love so that they can get to know about Jesus and the pardoning of their sins. And so he tells them this is love, but this love does not excuse them from keeping the commandments. You still got a job to do. And just saying I love you does not excuse you from what you're supposed to be doing. I can't tell my wife I love her and then go out and treat her bad. Do I really love her if I act like I don't? And it's all in words. And so when Jesus says to keep the commands, he talks about that. You still need to keep the commands. And then there's the proof. And if they do it, the branches will grow permanent fruit. The branches, will, the branches rather, will grow fruit that lasts. Uh, we are still talking about something that happened over 2,000 years ago because it's lasting fruit. Amen. There is a reason that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. And we know for 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus, born of, Joseph and born, of a, uh, born of Joseph and Mary, came to the world and hung, bled, and died for our sins and got up on the third day because it lasts. It's permanent fruit. Amen. You know what's temporary fruit? Some of the problems that we worry about day to day. Temporary fruit is some of the relationships that we have that we think are more important and we put all our time and energy into it. One of the most formative things that I ever heard was an interview with Russell Simmons, owner and founder of Def Jam Records. And here he is, who has made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars buying and selling Def Jam back to different companies. And he made his money off of music. And he said flat out when he was talking to a radio station personality, the man, you have one man who's made hundreds of millions of dollars getting artists signed and selling their records, and another man that's made a lot of money as well playing records, and he asked him a simple question. What was the number one song six months ago? Nobody in the room could name it. What was the number one song a year ago? Nobody in the room could name it. A room full of people who made a living off of music couldn't tell you what happened six months ago. But 2,000 years ago, I know that Jesus Christ won, went to Calvary for my sins. Now, I ain't saying music's bad. I'm just saying that all the things that we worry about in this world are temporary. But what you do for Christ will last. And so that is the permanent fruit. And then he says, whatever you ask in my name. You ask it in the name. Of, I talked about earlier, it's not that we are not connected. It's not that we are not connected connected to the Father, what has happened is we've just lost communication. Well, how do we communicate with God? Prayer. If you want to be on the vine and producing good fruit and operating in love, you're going to have to pray. Because it's going to be real hard to once you start interacting with a bunch of other people and trying to interact with them in love, you're going to need prayer to hold on. It's going to be the prayer that keeps you from putting hands on them. <laughs> It's going to be the prayer that keeps your blood pressure down. It's going to be the prayer that keeps you... I'm not saying that dealing with people is going to be perfect, but we still got to deal with them because guess what? You probably running up somebody else's blood pressure. You probably got somebody else that's trying to operate with you in love and is getting angry at you. It's, it's, it's a process, and we got to operate in love. And so we have to pray, and not just pray and stop. You have to continually pray. The Bible says in Isaiah to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he's near. First Thessalonians says to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You have to pray. The Bible says in Philippians, be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. It's not just a one shot and then leave it alone. I can't go to the gym one day and then think I'm good for the rest of the year. I can't eat one meal in January and think that I'm good for the rest of the year. If, if it doesn't work like that with that, why wouldn't prayer work the same? You keep fasting. You keep praying. You keep working in his word. You keep developing this relationship with God. I can't tell my wife I love you in February and don't say nothing else the rest of the year. If I talk to any one person one time and don't talk to them for the rest of the year, they don't think we're friends anymore. So if we spend this kind of effort developing relationships in the natural, we ought to spend that same kind of effort developing things in the supernatural. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep working. Keep fasting. Keep developing these relationships and keep operating in love. Keep loving God and keep loving people. And you operate in love to move forward. That is how we stay connected. I love cartoons. I spend, when I was growing up, probably too much time watching cartoons. I remember being at my grandmother's house watching cartoons, and my dad came in, saw me watching cartoons, and was talking to my grandmother, and was like, he watches too many cartoons. And at the time, I told him, Dad, I was, I was probably three or four, I'm probably going to watch cartoons until the day I die. And now that I have a son and a daughter, guess what I do with them? I watch cartoons. One of my favorite cartoons growing up was Transformers. More than meets the eye. The Transformers were these robots that had came to Earth and they could trans, they, the, in order to hide themselves in civilization, they transformed into cars and trucks and airplanes and, and all of these different things. And the, song, the, the theme song was Transformers, Robots in Disguise, Transformers More Than Meet the Eyes. And you had good guys, which were the Autobots, and you had bad guys, which were called the Decepticons. And this has been going on and on and on, and there, there are still movies coming out about Transformers. And guess what? When the next one comes out, I'm going to be front and center with my movie ticket watching it because I like the Transformers. But I didn't know this. I liked the Transformers. I liked He-Man. I liked uh, this other show called Matt. I liked these cartoons, but I didn't realize it growing up that these cartoons were made by the toy companies. And these cartoons were made by the toy companies because the toy companies made toys or bought the rights to other toys from another country and brought them over to the States. And they said, we got to figure out a way to sell more toys. And so we, we're going to come up with these cartoons. And these cartoons are going to get the toys and knowledge about the toys into all the households through the TV show on the cartoons. And everybody's going to watch Masters of the Universe and say, Mommy, I want a He-Man doll. They're going to watch G.I. Joe on the TV and say, I want a G.I. Joe toy. That's what they did. And so I didn't realize that until later. But I loved the Transformers. Would watch the Transformers on a regular basis. And somebody at Hasbro had decided that it was time to get a new set of toys out. And so they came out with this movie in 1986, Transformers the movie, and they decided we don't want you to buy certain toys anymore, so we're going to move in these new toys. My favorite Transformer was Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime was a, was a, a semi-truck. And Optimus Prime was so iconic that it's only been a handful of people that have played him. Whenever they needed the voiceover done, they went primarily to Peter Cullen, and he's the voice of the original Transformers. He's the voice of the cartoon, and when you watch the live-action movies right now, that's who you're hearing, Peter Cullen. He's been doing it for about 50-some-odd years. Or he's been doing voiceovers for 50-some-odd years, but he's the original voice of Optimus Prime. And so they decided that they didn't want to sell Optimus Prime anymore, so they came out with this movie, and they killed Optimus Prime. Imagine being six years old, going to a movie theater, and watching them 
kill off your favorite hero. The executives decided to get rid of Optimus Prime and a bunch of other uh, Transformers because they wanted those Transformers to go away and they wanted to sell you some new ones. And so they came up with this new one and they called him Hot Rod. And when he became the leader, he was Hot Rodimus Prime. I didn't want to play with no Hot Rod. I had a semi-truck. I had a big semi-truck with a whole bunch of stuff on the tractor trailer because he had a 53-foot trailer that could open up into a base and he did all of these different things. Don't nobody want to play with a hot rod after that. <laughs> but they killed Optimus Prime. And they brought in this guy by the name of Ron Friedman. And Ron Friedman was one of the writers on the movie and he told them from jump, hey, I don't think that's a good idea. You probably should not kill Optimus Prime. A lot of children like him. And he said when they interviewed him later, it was, so, it was such a big fallout that they've even put interviews with the executives and the DVDs and the 20th anniversary DVDs and all of this. And they all were like, we had no idea. We didn't know what to expect. We thought we were just going to go out and roll out some more expensive new toys and have everybody sell it. But he said, and Ron Freeman said, Hasbro didn't realize that Optimus Prime was the heartbeat of the Autobots, Friedman said. The strong and fatherly presence that made sure everybody else behaves and tries to live up to his example. You cannot pass that over and have any hope of duplicating the success that you had. And so they said, uh, and he later says, I was proved right because they resurrected him rapidly. They established an icon. So in 86, they had killed off Optimus Prime. But so many young children and adults that didn't want their children to be hurt out of love loved Optimus Prime so much that the very next movie, they had to bring him to life. They loved him so much that they could not keep Optimus Prime dead. They had to bring him back to life. And Optimus Prime had a device inside of him that kind of looked like a crown called the Matrix of Leadership. And so when he came back, they took that Matrix of Leadership off of that little funky hot rod and put it back in Optimus Prime where it needed to be because it was love. The love and devotion that the people had for Optimus Prime showed them that Optimus Prime could not stay dead. And so while they showed this love for Optimus Prime and the love for Optimus Prime brought Optimus Prime back from the dead, I'd like to talk about some other love. It was love that brought Jesus out of eternity to earth. It was love that took him to step out of eternity and put on human flesh. And, and know what it was like to be hungry and know what it was like to be thirsty and know what it was like to be tempted. It was love. It was love that brought him through Galilee. It was love that got him accused. It was love that let him sit there for these trumped up charges and get caught guilty because he was showing his love for us. It was love that allowed him to get beat with the cat of nine tails. It was love that had him carry that cross with all of our sins on it. It was love that held him, allowed them to put nails in his hands, pierce him in his side, and wound him in his back and put a crown of thorns on his head. It was love that took him to Golgotha, a.k.a. the place of the skull, a.k.a. Calvary. It was love that he would not come down for that, off that cross. He could have called 10,000 angels. But he stayed up there because if he'd have come down, I would have had to go up on there. So it was love that prevented him from causing him. It was love when they were teasing him and mocking him and talking about prophesy. Which one of us hit you, Jesus, when they blindfolded him? It was love. It was love that caused him to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was love. And he was looking for that love on the cross when he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? It was love. And it was love that caused him to die. And it was love that brought him up three days later with all power in his hands. It was love. 
It was love that had him go around and talk to the people. It was love. And it's love that's going to bring him back again. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come.